on Rich Planet, I have explored the subject of geopolitics and the control of the planet. I'm not talking about visible governments. I'm talking about influences that on the whole remain hidden, but manipulate the population through control of the media, control of governments, control of NGOs, control of banks, etc. Now, one document which some people believe is a handbook or a manual used by the elite in order to subvert, dominate and rule over the mass populace is the Protocols of Zion, written probably sometime in the 19th century. Controversy exists over who wrote the Protocols, what year they were written, why they were written and even what language they were written in. Here to discuss the history and the controversy of the Protocols of Zion is peace activist and author Dr. Nick Collestrom. Welcome back, Nick. Pleasure to be back, Richard. It's great to have you back here again. Now then, um, you were telling me before the interview, Nick, uh, the amount that, that the protocols have actually been read. I was quite surprised at what you were saying there. You said it's the second most popular book since the Bible. But that's what one hears. Yeah, it's been continuously in print, translated to every language on earth, uh, pro probably the most widely read book, second to the Bible. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 in, it's, it's permanently of, of interest to people because right. of the global tyranny which it describes. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody um, who came to one of my lectures a few years ago actually gave me a copy. Um, see it here. So this, I think, is from the 1920s, Nick. Um, so as I say, this is yeah, 19, so that's, 1920s. That's the original translation by Victor Marsden, in 19, 1923. Mm -hmm. um, now... Just touch on the controversy first before we, because we're going to go through the history and try and identify when they were written. Uh, I'm also, we're also going to go into what the protocols say. But just first, why is this such a controversial document? What's the... Well, it's about the extinguishing of hope, of everybody's hope, the establishing of a global uh, tyranny. And uh, everyone says, no, it wasn't us, we didn't write it. Uh, everyone claims not, not to have written it, not to know where it comes from. Uh, and, and denying any credible story of its origin, claiming it's a forgery, never saying what it's supposed to be a forgery of. So it's as if this document, this very awesome document made by some super intelligence with amazing understanding of economic matters uh, and a special sort of Freemason uh, knowledge, uh, this, as if it came out of nowhere. We're always given a story as if it just popped out of nowhere right at the end of the 19th century and, and you just get this mantra, oh, it's a forgery. It's a forgery. It is a forgery, isn't it? You do believe it's a forgery, don't you? Uh, and that's all you ever get. Right. Now, Freemasonry is referred to throughout the document, am I right? Right. And you believe that the 24 protocols, because there are, there are 24 separate protocols um, set out in the document, you believe that there were... A the way that they're written, they seem like they were lectures at some point. Yeah, very much. Uh, they often start off by saying, today we will discuss the economic plans, or last meeting we reviewed such and such, or it says, I often explain to you how anti-Semitism is necessary for the control of our lesser brethren. And then he sometimes says, as you economic gentlemen will understand. So he had top econo economists gathered to listen to him. So, so, you, so it's very much like a sequence of 24 lectures. Yeah. So you would say that these lectures, assuming that they were given, were given in a Masonic Lodge somewhere? Absolutely, yeah. Totally top secret, Masonic Lodge. Uh, and the whole thing is centred in France. It would have been in Paris. Right. Uh, and I can't help suspecting a special... Around about 1812, uh, the, the Mizraim Lodge became permeated with, with sort of Hebrew, uh, he, Hebrew Jewish uh, rituals and protocols, uh, procedures. The original Freemasonry w w did not have that character, but uh, it, it's to do with, with the uh, whole Illuminati movement in Bavaria at the end of mm -hmm. the previous century. Uh, and you get the Mizraim Lodge in Paris uh, being an obvious suspect centre where, where this is likely to have happened. All right, we'll go through some of the more detailed history a little bit later. Um, I just want to mention this book, uh, Behold a Pale Horse, by Bill Cooper, who felt it necessary to publish the entire protocols in his, um, in his book. And the other document that he, that he published was the um, Silent Weapons uh, for Quiet Wars, which was discovered a lot later than the Protocols of Zion. So 
Um, yeah, I recommend this book. Uh, the protocols are published in here, but pe people can find them on the internet. Yeah, the protocols. Yeah, yeah. So this is 24 protocols. Of what? Maybe four or five pages on each one in 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 the document, which set out how they are going to dominate mm. the Goyim as it's as it's Goyim, explained. Yeah, so just because yeah. obviously the, the the two words that are used in, in the document are uh, the Jews and the Goyim. Yeah. So. Um, we're trying to determine what is the true history, what's yeah. the true origin, yeah. what was the purpose of, because there's controversy over why they were written, but so just explain what Goyim is and what, what it's... Well, the only other place in world literature where Goyim were used in the same you know, deeply contemptuous sense as, as the, the, the rabble, the rest of the human race, is the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud. Uh, so that immediately gives you a sort of perspective. I, I would say this is uh, this is a t t Talmudic Jew uh, at the top, a uh, uh, 33 degree Mason um, uh, who, who wrote this, yeah. mm -hmm. and who gave the course, yeah. They're referring to the mass of the population in a very um, disparaging way. Uh, as I say in one of the the Goyim may amuse themselves as they wish until the hour strikes. Well, let's, because you've picked out a few of your favourite quotes, Nick, from, the, from these protocols. Let me... Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a selection of quotes from each, right. each of the protocols, yeah. just so that people can get a flavour. If you want to read them, you can find them on the internet. We can't. We haven't got time to recite them all mm. in this programme, but I will read some quotes from them. So Nick's just highlighted a few in uh, Bill Cooper's book here. So the first one here, um, our countersign is force and make-believe. Yeah, oh, God, that is so true, isn't it? That is, in a way, the most profound statement of, of how things unfold in the... 20th and 21st century. Mm. I mean, if you look at state fabricated terror in our modern world, the, the deaths are real, but the story is bogus. You, you know, real force is used, but the narrative is baloney. Mm. Uh, so that, that is really the essential combination for this uh, treacherous power taking over world control. I mean, there's endless dispute, is this genuine or, or not? Uh, that's what all the world wonders. Is there or is there not such a plan going on? Mm. Um, and I'm suggesting that uh, instead of debating that endlessly and inconclusively, we should try looking at the genesis and origin of, of, of this text. I think that would give us mm -hmm. some light on the matter. All right. And um, here's another one that you've highlighted. Who and what is in a position to overthrow an invisible force? And this is precisely what our force is. Gentile masonry blindly serves as a screen for us and our objectives. But the plan of action of our force, even its very abiding place, remains for the whole people an unknown mystery. Yeah, well, that is strange, isn't it? Uh, w w why should it be uh, not, not findable or not locatable? I mean, the Rothschilds lived in Frankfurt. There wasn't any mystery there. Uh, the Bavarian Illuminati had a certain location. Um, I'd say this is to do with uh, the whole Illuminati movement going into the... Freemasons, the end of the 18th century, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, which is a kind of hidden, hidden thing. Um, so, uh, but I, I would say in our modern, modern world that there is a mystery who, who is doing these things. Mm -hmm. Whenever you get from state fabricated terror and, and a, a fake bogus enemy is, is given the blame, you never really find out who is doing these events. Yeah, There's yeah. A, something horribly secret, but also... Um, uh, the, there's a unity of purpose around different places of the world where these events happen. So there is a mystery of, of, of where this thing is located. I mean, one of the words of the protocol, it says, it is from us that the all-embracing terror proceeds. Uh, and and uh, what, what, what is the source that, that mm -hmm. designates and wills that uh, terror be used in politics? And it states very clearly there that that's their modus operandi, that they will remain hidden, um, so that they can carry out their plan. Mm. All right. Uh, now, what I was going to attempt to do for this show was to summarise each of the 24 protocols and, and give maybe a title or, or a short paragraph. I found Sounds it, rather ambitious, Richard. Yeah, I, I found yeah. it rather difficult because within each protocol, they seem to be quite diverse in the things that they're stating, and there's a lot of overlap between each Yeah, I mean, as Solzhenitsyn said, the author is someone well above average intelligence and design the protocols is more complicated than a nuclear bomb. Right. So it's a very detailed, well thought out plan of how to control the media, 
uh, economic policy, how to undermine the established powers in, in, in terrific detail, enormous ramifications by someone who clearly hasn't got his knowledge out of books. It is from real life experience that, you know, that these things are being laid down. So what I've done in order to help me do this is um, Nick has shown me this book. Just um, give the title of that book, Nick. Well, this is uh, Henry Macau, Illuminati, the cult that hijacked the world. Uh, and uh, so most rulers will have heard of him. Uh, and uh, he's got a summary, and he's got the all-important thesis, which we'll come on to, about a certain book by Maurice Johnny in France, published in 1864, which overlaps with the protocols. Everyone agrees they overlap. And practically all commentators will say that the forging of the protocols was done by getting this jolly book and copying bits out of it. And Henry Macker says the opposite. He says, no, jolly... I had seen the protocols which had already been composed then. Mm -hmm. I think that's terribly important, right. and I, I will be endorsing his view. All right, so what I've done is I've, I've taken a summary of his summary, okay, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to, we're going to do a section now, this will take a few minutes to get through, where I'm going to go through each of the protocols and read a, sh a very short extract from each of the protocols, Nick, just so that people have got mm -hmm. a reasonable overview. Yeah. It, it, but obviously it is not a full overview by any means. You would need to read them in order to, to get a grip of them fully. But here's he a, he a flavour anyway. So Protocol 1. Morality is an obstacle to successful conquest and a liability to any political leadership. The goal is to scatter to the winds all existing forces for order and regulation and to become the sovereign lord of those so stupid as to lay down their powers and fall for liberal entreaties. Protocol 2, uh, Gentile leaders, meaning non-Jewish, uh, administrators, will be chosen for their strict obedience and will be run by advisers. The Goyim can amuse themselves until the hour strikes. We have implanted the false doctrines by means of our press, arousing blind confidence in these theories. The press has fallen into our hands. It fashions the thought of the people. Its role is to express and create discontent. Thanks to the press, we have the gold in our hands, though we sacrifice many of our people. Each, in the sight of God, is worth a thousand goyim. So we need to bear in mind this is written a long, long time ago, talking about that the press has fallen into their hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, protocol number three, we have made a gulf between the far-seeing sovereign power and the blind force of the people so that both have lost all meaning. For like the blind man and his stick, both are powerless apart. So they're talking about their controlling an entire nation by making sure that its sovereign isn't connected to the, the people or the goyim. Protocol four. Freedom would be possible if it rested upon the foundation of faith in God. The brotherhood of humanity unconnected with the conception of equality, which is negated by the very laws of creation. This is the reason why it is indispensable for us to undermine all faith, to tear out of the minds of the Goyim the very principle of Godhead and the Spirit, and to put in its place material needs. Protocol 5. We shall create an intensified centralization of government in order to grip in our hands all the forces of the community. We shall regulate mechanically all the actions of the political life of our subjects with new laws. In order to put public opinion in our hands, we must bring it into a state of bewilderment by giving expression from all sides to so many contradictory opinions to make the Goyim lose their heads in the labyrinth and come to see that the best thing is to have no opinion at all in matters political. Protocol 6. In every possible way we must develop the significance of our super-government by representing it as the protector and benefactor of all those who voluntarily submit to us. Protocol 7. We must compel the government of the Goyim to fall in with our plan already approaching desired consummation by requiring them to obey public opinion which we control through that great power already in our hands the press protocol 8 for a time until there will no longer be a risk of entrusting the responsible posts in our states to our brother jews we shall put them in the hands of persons whose past and reputation are such that if they disobey our instructions must face criminal charges or disappear 
that is in order to make them defend our interests to their last grasp. That's very interesting. It's talking about blackmail, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, right. um, Protocol 9, we have taken control of the institutions of the Goyim using the chaotic license of liberalism. We have got our hands into the administration of the law, into the conduct of elections, into the press, into the liberty of the person, mm -hmm. but principally into education and training as being the cornerstones of a free existence. Protocol 10. How indeed are the Goyim to perceive the underlying meanings of things when their representatives give the best of their energies to enjoying themselves? Protocol 11. We shall keep promising them to give back all the liberties we have taken away as soon as we have quelled the enemies of peace and tamed all parties. It is not worthwhile discussing how long they will be kept waiting for the return of their liberties. Protocol 12. The majority of the public have not the slightest idea what ends the press really serves. Protocol 13. We further distract the masses with amusements, games, art, sport from questions in which we should find ourselves compelled to oppose them. Protocol 14. Our wise men trained to become leaders of the Goyim will compose materials which will be used to influence the minds of the Goyim, directing them towards such understanding and forms of knowledge as have been determined by us. Protocol 15. We hasten the death of those who hinder our affairs. Simple as that. Simple as that yeah. Protocol 16. We shall swallow up and confiscate to our own use the last scintilla of independence of thought. We will turn the Goyim into unthinking, submissive brutes, waiting for things to be presented before their eyes in order to form an idea of them. Protocol 17. In our program, one third of our subjects will keep the rest under observation from a sense of duty on the principle of volunteer service to the state. Protocol 18. We have broken the prestige of the Goy kings by frequent attempts upon their lives through our agents, mm. blind sheep of our flock, who are easily moved by a few liberal phrases to crimes, provided only they be painted in political colours. Protocol 19. I hope we have succeeded in preventing the Goyim from adopting this means of contending with sedition. This means uh, to taint it with some larceny or sexual abuse, and two, to make a severe example of one offender. Protocol 20. Economic crises have been produced by us for the Goyim by no other means than the withdrawal of money from circulation. So they're talking about an orchestrated financial collapse yeah, there. Yeah. Protocol 21. In our hands is the highest power of our day, gold. Surely there is no need to seek further proof that our rule is predestined by God. All right, so that's a flavour anyway. As I say, right. People can, yeah. can read um, yeah. more if, if they wish. Um, all right, then. So let's now... Oh, oh, should we go back in time right the way to 1776? Right. Um, to the Illuminati movement, yeah. Uh, because obviously the word Illuminati. Let's just let's just deal with that first. The actual word, because it has multiple meanings. A lot of people use the Illuminati just to describe the New World Order or those who are controlling the planet, and it's a, it's it's a word which is tainted, I think, in general when it's used in a general sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's be, let's realise. But it had a total historical meaning at the end of the 19th century with the, the, the brilliant mastermind Adam Weishaupt. He was in Bavaria. He was the son of a rabbi and the, the Rothschilds were funding him. And he set up this terrifically potent new movement, which posed as sort of benefactors to humanity, rational enlightenment. And it was about the dissolving of all belief, all governments, uh, all nation states, uh, undermining of all existing establishments. And uh, he then got banned by Bavaria about a decade after it was founded, and uh, it went underground into the uh, into the Freemason first three levels of Freemasonry, uh, and uh, it then so it persisted in a underground kind of manner. Went into say America through Freemasonry, uh, and uh, uh, world leaders started getting very alarmed. What is this new power? And I would say it's terribly important to understand that the French Revolution was actually caused by uh, these 
Illuminati agents. So just a question before you go on to the French Revolution, Nick. Uh, so Freemasonry was well established by 1776, is that right? Uh, it, yeah, it had a different ca character th then. It was, uh, it was just about, you know, Masons, builders. It was very fashionable. It was about the divine architect. Uh, it didn't have the very sinister connotation which it then came to have uh, as right. this new uh, new element went into Freemasonry. But was it still ran by keeping secrets and that kind of thing? Was it still yeah. a secret yeah, organization? Yeah, it was totally secret. It was all male club, totally secret. And then um, this Illuminati uh, became the, uh, the, a particular type of Freemasonry that, that then then developed right. and uh, it's important because the protocol specifically say you, you know we brought about the French Revolution and, and we know the people who did it uh, and it, it is within as it were living memory of the French Revolution that the protocols were composed this is a very important precursor the ability of hidden Illuminati agents to undermine a state like that mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so historically I would say the the Bavarian Illuminati is, is a central component of what then became the we, the frightening, all-powerful we in, in mm -hmm. the protocols. Who are the we? Uh, and that they are, they are top-level Freemasons, they are the old Illuminati, they are Talmudic Jews, they are international bankers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and these kind of work together, this frightening we of the protocols. Right. So 1789 is the French Revolution. So you would say, without any doubt, the protocols must have been written after 1789, because totally, it's, yeah. it's referring totally, to the yeah. French yeah. Revolution. So just yeah. tell us how this small group managed to orchestrate the French Revolution. Oh, well, I'm not Is really that? a historian, you know, I can't really go, go, go into that. Uh, but uh, academic historians will totally dismiss this claim. That they will say that's just a conspiracy theory. Right. So I think it's terribly important for viewers to evaluate whether they want to believe this or not. The underground, hidden uh, current uh, from the strictly banned Illuminati in, in Bavaria, uh, th th they did bring about this, this event. Uh, I, I, I feel there's enough evidence that that did happen. And that, that is then followed by the next stu stupendous event after the Napoleonic Wars, the Rothschilds take over the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one family dynasty gets awesome power that no family on this planet had ever had before. Uh, it takes over the Bank of England and then the, the French, also the French currency. Right. These come to be in effect owned by the Rothschilds with uh, stupendous right. wealth. So, so the Bank of England was set up in 1694 and you're saying that it was it effectively, who was controlling it cha well, changed in 1815? Uh, so how I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so how did yeah. how did that come about? Um, well, it was again a detailed story of in the wake of the Napoleonic uh, conquest, a, a Rothschild posed as having the uh, looked came to England. He had heard early news from a pigeon carrier, uh, and he posed as if uh, as if Britain had uh, lost the war. And everybody started selling, uh, and and he, he bought uh, he, he bought while others were selling. Right. But uh, I'm I'm just a science historian, Richard. D don't ask me details about European his history. Like right. This. Um, I, I can just give, I'm just giving you the overall uh, sketchy background why I think the protocols were composed around about 1830 or 1840, mm -hmm. uh, and it was in the wake of these tremendous events that a dynasty. Uh, came to came to have power over national currencies and the idea of being able to manipulate states by external debt which they wouldn't be able to repay that, that was a, a quite new concept which is central to the protocols right so 1815 rothschild gains control of bank of england what about the other european countries and with regards to their banking yeah a few, a few years later the same happened in in, in france uh, and so you you had international uh, ministers of economics coming to the Rothschilds for loans uh, and, and to help with their finances uh, and, and uh, I'm saying that is the situation which which enabled the protocols to be conceived by the great mastermind who was at the, the Mizraim Lodge in Paris so uh, so this was a Rothschild and he was giving a sequence of lectures and he had top economists listening to him. Right. Uh, now, um, there's a book 
written by Morris Jolly, who you, that you've mentioned, um, entitled Dialogues in Hell. Hmm. Yeah. So we know when that was published, yeah, 1864. Yeah. Right? So just to give us a background to that book. Well, everybody agrees that these two books, the two texts, copy off each other. One is copied from the other because it's overlap. Nearly one sixth of the protocols overlap with the Morris Jolly book. Uh, and whenever you hear, oh, it's just a forgery, it's just a forgery, they, al they always have the claim that the story is that the secret police of Ru Russian secret police go to France. For some reason, they want to whip up anti Semitism. Why is not disclosed? And, and they have the totally bizarre concept of how to do it by going to France in Paris, finding the Maurice Jolly book, which has been confiscated, and there may not have been any copies in Paris then. They may have had to go to, I don't know, Istanbul or somewhere to find a remaining copy. And they then copied off that book to produce the protocols in French, it was written in French, and then take it back, and somebody has to retranslate this thing written by French, written in French, back to. Russian. So uh, I would say this is a story that makes no sense on any level what, 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 whatsoever. But that is the story of it being a, 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 a fraud. Uh, and and uh, Look, Am I right in thinking that the protocols themselves are a lot more extensive than what um, Jolly wrote in well, Dialogues in Hell? Yeah, Jolly's book has nothing about anti-Semitism. I don't think it's got anything about Jews in it, actually. Uh, he was himself a Jew. Um, and uh, he was in the same Mizraim Lodge, uh, so he's a Freemason, so he's bound by oaths of secrecy, what he's allowed to say, uh, and, he, and he said, I, I would say the meaning of his book, Dialogues Now, it's terribly important to read the preface of it, where he explains what the book's about, uh, and the terrible new thing he's seen, which if I may just read the, these words, because this is always ignored, I, I would say he's in a state of despair, because he's seen the early draft of the Protocols, right? And not just that, but he experiences something which is working in the body politic, and he can't see anything that can stop it. And it's within his living memory that it began. That's what he said. I'll just read out. Uh, One political system in particular has not varied in its methods for a single day since the unfortunate and alas, already too far away date of its inauguration. So the plan, protocols, has begun, right? The supernatural duration of certain successes in this field is furthermore intended to corrupt honesty itself. So whatever's happening is so powerful and potent that he almost feels that it's supernatural. But the public conscience yet remains, and the heavens will one day interfere in the games being played against it. So he feels as if heaven itself is needed to stop this plan, whatever it is. Then about some years after composing this text, he commits suicide. So he's in kind of despair. He writes this text to try and tell people what he can about it, uh, but he's not allowed to say more. Uh, and and uh, so I would say he is, he is a person who's seen the early draft of the protocols uh, and, and, and uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to put it the other way around. Because if you think about it, the method, let's say it's a genuine document, the method by which it's been discredited is a method similar to those methods explained in the protocols. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I.e., oh, it was just done to discredit us, we're going to blame them over there. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the discrediting happened uh, synchronously, 1920, 21. Uh, all the, suddenly, all the different countries had articles, New York, Paris, London, claiming, oh, it's just a forgery, it's just a forgery, uh, and giving it a weird and extremely unlikely story about how it's forged. Uh, uh, okay? Uh, uh, and, and as you say, that is showing the methods which given in, in the protocols, yeah. The, the protocols were most in two sections, it's terribly important to understand. We've looked at the basic composition, the whole stupendous 24-fold argument, and I'm saying it is one genius brain composed that, and it has to have been early in the 9th century, not later. Everyone says, oh, composed at the end of the 9th century. Well, there are bits in the protocols, such as referring to the metro in Paris, about it. But those are cosmetic additions, okay? The first Zionist Congress in Basel, uh, as if it was being polished up for that, uh, and certain additions, you see, he refers to some people, politicians have some stain on their character, some Panama. So Panama was some debacle in French politics, uh, recently happened in the 19th century, okay? Mm -hmm. So those are slight additions, and possibly the title, Protocol of Zion, possibly that title is added. But the only important thing to understand is that the whole, the whole focus 
of international Judaism at the end of the 9th century was Zionism. That was the big issue. That's what the whole Congress was about, to try and get home for Jews, right? And the protocols got not a word of Zionism in them, not a word, okay? So they, that, that, they were composed at a much earlier time before the great Zion, dream of Zionism had blossomed. That's why they cannot possibly have been composed at the end of the 9th century. So I, I, I would say we need to have these two phases in mind of the basic composition and then slight touching up additions at the end of the 9th century. Okay. And when, because it wasn't, it didn't appear in English until... 1920. 1920. But we'll come on to that because we've got a few other things to cover first. Uh, 1894, you get the copying of the protocols. Somebody called Glinka, a Russian lady, gets someone in the Mizram Lodge, pays him to copy the text, and she takes it over to Russia. Uh, and she then gets a translation. So that is when this top secret doc document gets smuggled out, uh, and, and the, the guy who's copied it tries to escape, but it quickly gets bumped off. So when, when the protocols go to Russia, they're, they're written in French. Yeah. Someone in Russia translates them into Russian. Yeah. And then they're then retranslated back into French. Is that right? Well, a translated basically into English. All right. But there was From Russian French, into English. Yeah. But uh, there was, it did also happen back in the French, but the original, there's no trace of the original French document. That's part of the kind of paradox, because obviously the powers that be, or, or the powers described in the protocols, uh, want in every way to destroy any evidence of the existence of this document. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a whole series of the protocols uh, was published in its, uh, issues of a Russian magazine uh, right at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, and none of those whatever still exist. They've all vanished. Right. Uh, so they were published in Russian at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, now, but they didn't appear in English until 1920. The owner of the Times uh, newspaper was interested in them. Lord Northcliffe, yeah, yeah. Right, so Let's just say Sergei Nihilus, a Russian monk, obtained his copy in 1901, and then he published his book about the Antichrist in 1905, which contained the Russian text of the Protocols. That's the main text, and a copy of that now resides in the British Library, and that may be the only one left, as far as anyone knows. Uh, and uh, that copy of the British Library was then used for the English translation, of which you've got a copy there, mm -hmm. uh, appeared in, in that published in 1923. Um, uh, but in 1920, the English-speaking world became aware of the protocols, and immediately the sort of mass media went into action saying, oh, it's just a forgery, just a forgery, just a forgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this fellow you mentioned, Northcliffe, one of the most powerful people in, in Britain, he owned the Times and the Daily Mail, he wrote an article saying, well, what is the extraordinary prophetic power that these protocols have? Can we have some inquiry into where they came from? Because the main thing that struck everyone when they appeared in English was their prophetic nature, because the whole Bolshevik revolution, uh, it was evident that they had been totally following the instructions given in the protocols, okay? And uh, anyone in communist Russia having a copy of the protocols as a death penalty. Right, that was in place for about 40 years. So Lord Northcliffe called for an inquiry in an article, I think it was Daily Mail, into where these protocols had come from. What was the extra and the extraordinary knowledge they seemed to knowledge of human nature they seemed to show. And, and Northcliffe, do you know if he was a Freemason, or was he Jewish? No, he wasn't. No, no. And so he wasn't Jewish and he wasn't a Freemason then? Well, I don't know. That you know, that you know. Don't know. Right, okay. So he's trying, he's, he, he's, he wants to investigate this, possibly to print about it in his newspaper. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that was almost the last statement printed in the British newspaper, which didn't say that it was a forgery. After that, it becomes mandatory to say it's a forgery in everything published, okay? Mm -hmm. But he called for, and he obviously paid paid a heavy price for, uh, for calling for that inquiry. So what happened to him then? Well, first of all, uh, he uh, he lost control of his own newspapers. Uh, he was ousted. Then he he was declared insane, literally. Some medical report claiming that he was insane, and then he got bumped off by food poisoning very soon after. Right. Uh, so he, he quickly became uh, another prime example of the policy dictated and expanded in the in the protocols yeah. of how to deal with opposition. Yeah. Anyone who gets in our way will be killed. That's what yeah. it says in the protocols. Um, 
Anyway, a bit like Henry Ford, he was the most powerful man in America. He published in the Dearborn Independent, serialised the protocols and commented a lot upon them. And he was one of the last people to say that they were genuine, right? So what year would that be, Nick? Well, it was early, early around, uh, 18, no, 1920s. And he had to grovel with, in the, with apology. He was made to apologise for having said that and retract it, which is Henry Ford. quite extraordinary in the most powerful man in America. I've got a quote from him here, Nick. Right, yeah. uh, it is too terribly real for fiction, too well sustained for speculation, too deep in its knowledge of the secret springs of life for forgery. Yeah, that's a very, uh, I think that's a very good quote about the protocols. That, uh, that was the impact they made on him. Now, the, the other clue, perhaps, it, it talks about control of the press, and we have gained control of the press, but it doesn't mention film. No, no. So but That's very important. Film was, what, 1870 or something, it developed. So, at the end of the 19th century, anyone talking about use of the media and control of the media for public interest would obviously have discussed film. You, you couldn't have missed it out. Uh, and uh, I think this is clear proof that it was composed at a much earlier date. Right, so before 1864, within the lifetime of um, Morris Jolly, after 1815, because that's when we had the financial collapse yeah, that it speaks yeah, about. Yeah. So you think maybe if you were to put a date on it, 1830 or something like that? Yeah, 1830, 40, and the, uh, it was a teetotal author, because he, he scoffs at the going for drinking alcohol. Um, so... so, so I, I, I would say I would agree with Henry Mackow. This has to be a this has to be a top Rothschild uh, giving this with his tremendous financial knowledge uh, and his belief in God's chosen people uh, and so forth. So we're not making a clear statement. They're definitely a forgery, or they were definitely a real book that was that was uh, given lectures on to high-ranking Freemasons. But let's just say it was the second. Let's just say it's a real book, and it's been and it was used to. Um, pass this message or this knowledge down, mm -hmm. and it's written, let's say, in 1835, for, for, for example. Right? Yeah, and yeah. So, can you identify who may have authored it? Well, I, I was just saying... If, that, if that's the era that it's written, the, the, you know, the, who was around at the time that was... Yeah, my, my, I'm not sure, but one of the Rothschilds, Maya, Maya or... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, one, one of them, uh, he made a statement... Uh, Give me control of a nation's economy, and I care not who, who not I care not who passes the laws. Uh, that, uh, that he made that around 1830, right? Uh, and and uh, that, that that is the kind of mind uh, mindset of, of of the author. So let's just go down the line, and we're not stating that as a fact. We're hypothesising that it's a, it was a genuine document in order to roll out their policy, if you like, but in a secret way. Mm -hmm. So just paint the picture. So this will be happening in Paris, Nick, would it? Yeah. In, in, yeah. in some lodge. Yeah, yeah, secret, so, secret the, the Mizraim Lodge in Paris, uh, and it was a top secret document. Uh, and and um, So the, the kind of people that would be these very high level Freemasons would be what, economists and Owners of newspapers. Yeah. Or just, yeah. just fill us in on what you think. Just describe the scenario as well, to what. Uh, as you said, I mean, I don't know who they were, but uh, the, 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 they clearly, they clearly were top economists who are referred to in the protocols, listening in, amongst the audience, uh, uh, and uh, statesmen, uh, statesmen who, who would be listening to this. So it was a very elite audience, uh, and uh, j jolly. Jolly was was there. He he was in the lodge somewhat later, somewhat later time, uh, and he would have seen seen that text. Yeah. So, so do you think if there was people, um, if they let's say they're trying to influence Britain mm -hmm. through this through this uh, the protocols, let's say, but mm. it's all happening in Paris. Mm. So would there be Masons going over to Paris to receive these lectures? Do you think, or would, or would someone yeah, come yeah. over and give lectures in a, in a Brit British lodges? How, how would how would that work? Do you think, or is it just all completely secret? You don't know. It's all completely secret. We don't, we don't know. But but I think it's very reasonable to, to suspect that people would would want to hear a Rothschild speaking on these matters. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and there may have been lodgers in the UK at that time that were preaching what's in the protocols. You think it's possible? Well, 
This is, this is all hidden, Richard. This, this is the whole thing. That, uh, I mean, when, uh, when were lodges set up in, in this country? Do you know what, what the history of Freemasonry is? That, 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 the, the, well, it was set up, yeah, 1717, the first British lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's earlier time than we're talking about, right. the London Lodge. Uh, and, but this new element uh, permeated it like a century later, about a century after that. Mm -hmm. uh, this new, uh, uh, grand, was it Grand Orient Lodge it was called? Mm -hmm. um, now viewers may remember um, Zaid who was on the show, who um, has researched uh, politics of the Middle East and Europe. Mm -hmm. And he, he, I've asked him to, g to give his opinion on the protocol, so I'll just mm -hmm. read out and then maybe you can comment on it. Yeah. He says, I'm not sure if anyone actually believes the protocols were read verbatim in their published format at some congress of Jewish yeah, leaders. No evidence that, yeah. However, there is likely a spectrum of belief amongst interested parties ranging from the mainstream assertion that they are wholeheartedly an anti-Jewish forgery to the belief that they are in fact a dramatised version of other genuine source material. Whatever the origins of the protocols, they do in fact describe so well the means that elites control societies, whoever we identify those elites to be. If we move away from the perpetrators discussed in the protocols to just the means of control described, which are provably true, if a significant number of the masses became aware of this information, it would be incredibly dangerous for those in positions of power. What is described in the protocols was going on longer than their purported creation, most certainly throughout the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. The papers and media back then worked in much the same way as they do today, manipulating the masses. So in that sense, the protocols are not so revolutionary, yet remain an accurate, albeit generalised, expose of how the world really works. There are many truisms within the protocols and comparisons, such as the masses being like cattle, is an accurate one. The mechanics of power that are utilised because of this is a reflection of this unfortunate state of human affairs. Yeah. So, that's Zaid's comments. Right. Well, um, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with anything there, but uh, I, I feel if we get a historical account of the development through the 19th century, uh, it's, it's more helpful. Uh, and um, I perhaps add, Richard, that uh, in terms of them coming out of France into Russia, that is so interesting and important. Uh, there's a son of Nihilus. Nihilus is the guy who published them. And he testified there was a trial at Bern. I think um, 1935, uh, somebody accused or trying to stop them publishing the protocol. So there was actually a trial in which a lot of stuff came out. And he testified that his father had received the original version in French. Mm -hmm. That he had received it and, and, and therefore presumably done his own translation. Uh, and I, I think that's important independent testimony from the son of the guy who published it because his. What he published, his book, has never been translated into English. People have wished. That's one of the things people like uh, Lord Northcliffe said. Wouldn't it be a help if we could have an tr English translation of what mm. Nihilus um, published, which, uh, uh, you know, is impossible. Like, mm. Anyone, most things, try and investigate the protocols. You just come up against a brick wall. Mm. No, you can't do it. No, we've lost the text and so on. So I think that's an important, uh, uh, important step of the argument. Right. Uh, and uh, as I say, it was around 1894 that that really happened of the, of the protocols being taken over to Russia. Uh, and you first, from then you, you begin to get people testifying it when they've seen the, the original copy or an original copy. Uh, and there's more than one translation in, into Russian. Uh, and uh, I think that gives a bit of historical depth, uh, as I say. So this is immediately prior to the first international congress um, and in russia it was an immediate death sentence if you had a copy of this. totally yeah yeah in Bolshevik russia i think this cop this is a reprint from the 1923 right, one it yeah. says 1936 this yeah. is reprint but it's yeah. i think it's it says here introduction 1922 so but uh, can i just go over the the unlikely nature of the forgery claim yeah absolutely uh, uh, um uh this very profound document is allegedly composed by some Russian secret police 
uh, and it's alleged that they somehow wanted anti-Semitism to be whipped up in Russia. What, what were they trying to do? Who authorised them to do it? Uh, that, that, that's not made clear at all. And these these secret police who are named uh, don't have any special literary literary uh, genius or facility, and they're supposed to have got hold of a book which was almost unobtainable because this kind of satire or dialogue in hell of Jolly was all copies were confiscated in France. Okay, Napoleon the Third confiscated all copies, uh, and, and uh, so just to then is that do you think that's because Napoleon the Third was linked to um, the Rothschilds and part of their lodge? Well, it's said to be because he didn't like what was in it. Right. Uh, that, that right. Was, that's all we're talking about. Okay. Right? So, so w first of all, why would they want to hunt for a book almost unobtainable? Uh, how would they know that they wanted that book? And uh, when they got it, it hadn't got anything about anti-Semitism in it. It was it was a it, it was a, a dialogue about a tyrannical political system. Uh, and why would they want to use that to compose this uh, text? And then, why would, if they composed a the text in French, if you imagine they did do it, why would they want to give it to an obscure Russian monk who'd have it in his possession for years on the supposition that he might then translate it back into Russian? Uh, I mean, no, none of that story makes any sense. Mm. Um, and uh, people seem to have a complete mental blockage against trying to look at this. Uh, I mean, as a science historian, I, f I feel we should try and look at the genesis and origin of, of the text what we do know about it, uh, and uh, in a sense, the first clear evidence is from it's appearing in, in Russia um, uh, in different places, different people testified having seen it, um, uh, and it's evidently been smuggled out from Paris, um, I, 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 I would say. And then within the text itself, I would say you've got evidence for it being composed, you know, by a supreme uh, banker genius. <laughs> that has to be one of the Rothschilds. And it's, it's, it says that what is it? They're, they're hidden. Our countersign is false and make-believe. Um, it mentions Darwinism as well. Yeah, yeah, that's not like satirical. It, 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 this is one of the things added at the end of the 19th century. That one of the successes we arranged for Nietzscheism and Darwinism and Marxism to undermine the Goyim. Well, I, I don't think they did. Uh, Arranged for Darwin, Darwin or, or Nietzsche, um, so that might be slightly satirical, and it might be used to. Well, it, it obviously has been used. People say that so the, the whole thing is just some satire and so on, but uh, I, I would say that's added in, uh, as in in the, in the right. 1890s, yeah. Right, because it, it, it mentions science and in 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 it's stating that they are going to. Uh, define the science so that the goyim can be controlled through that science. That's my, well the interpretation that I I, I got. That, that science is going to be in our hands. Uh -huh. and, and so and it gives Darwinism as an example of how it's science which is being used. Well, the idea that they can control universities' yeah. teachings that less to, in order to confuse and perplex the goyim. Yeah, they do say that. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, this is unusual. Who and what is in a position to overthrow an invisible force? Yeah, well, can I um, end on a note, note of hope here, Richard? Can I, mm. note of hope, right. The solution, if you've got an unseen controlling power, which you can't quite locate, you don't know who it is who's controlling you, the solution is just to stop having a financial system in which money is created out of nothing. But that is what gives the godlike power to these people, that they can print money whenever they want and charge you interest on it for just having the money. That's what started in 1694 with Bank of England, so-called Bank of England. Mm. Uh, and countries need a banking system. This is the worst crime, the most terribly punished crime uh, in the modern world, having your own banking system which is not linked to international Rothschild yeah. finance. And, and that is the solution. And it's the only solution. Uh, as long as we keep with the finance we've got at the moment, you're giving unlimited power to the hidden ones who will always control you. Well, there are only a few countries now left that aren't connected to the international bank yeah, system yeah, well, and are in debt to that system. Yeah, what are they? Uh, North Korea. Iran, is it? They're all the Iran, ones on the, on the list. Yeah, yeah, Iran, Cuba, uh, you know, Syria. Uh, 
but it's, it's in a situation where the, the the momentum that they have with the system, world monetary system that they have. Yeah. Um, how how do you how do you reform it and change it and actually get into a situation where the currency is originated as a credit for the people? It's not being loaned to yeah. government. Yeah. Well, this is the power that the author of the Protocols Times has. The, the, the we, the dreadful we, it says the guy cannot organise themselves sufficiently to resist what we, we've mm. done. It's completely dumb of them to allow us, us, to give them money that charge interest at source, but they cannot, they cannot, um, they cannot get together sufficiently to oppose what I we've mean, got. Here's another way that I sometimes express it, Nick. It is not possible for a government, a sovereign government, to have any debt when its currency is a fiat currency. Right? Because the sovereign government should be in charge of that currency and the issuance of that currency. So therefore, it's not possible for a sovereign government to have debt. It means it's not the government. Right. It means the government isn't really... Our government is not really a government because, right. it, because it could write off its debt if it was a government, couldn't yeah, it? It could, yeah. you could just print that money. Yeah, right? it, it hasn't it, got the authority to. So your government really... I would rename the government. Where the, the government is whoever is is originating that currency. As the, as the Rothschild said, give me a control of a country's money yeah. and I care not who makes its yeah, laws. Yeah. And right? this is one of the key bits where the jolly text overlaps with the um, protocols. And I could sort of throw in, they have 5% interest charged to nation states for international loans. Uh, and that's one thing that you find both in the jolly text and, 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 and the protocols. The protocols, mm. uh, and, 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 and as you say, that is that situation that uh, that, uh, that that is the technique of control. Yeah, mm. and there are so many things. If you go away and read them, there are so many things. When you read them, uh, you think it is happening today. They're clearly using the same whoever oh, whoever's in control today are yeah. um, following principles in that book. Yeah, that is what William Cooper says in that Behold the Pale Horse, that it is the blueprint for the 20th century. What's happening in the 20th century, uh, that is the testament of authenticity of the protocols, that you can see what's happening in the 20th century. Um, it was blueprinted there. Uh, mm. People get that, you get the eerie sense of prophecy and foretelling when you read that in text. Yeah, it, like the, the, this one, just very simply, um, let's put, yeah, yeah, Protocol 12, the majority of the public have not the slightest idea what ends the press really serves, right? right. So that's written, let's say, 1830, right. uh, cool. well over 100 years ago, approaching 200 years ago, yeah. someone's written that. Yeah that the press is in the hands of an elite who were using it to manipulate the public. Nearly 200 years ago, the press was in, the, in, in someone else, in, in private hands, being used to manipulate the masses. Course, it's yeah. not a new concept. No, no. Um, and it's so much of what is set out is, is clearly being applied today. Yeah, so I'd like to urge that, uh, that uh, without, perhaps without, trying to grapple with the titanic issues of, of world control, world domination, that, that we, we allow ourselves to talk amongst ourselves on the origin and, and phase development of the protocols uh, and the historical evidence of the sequence of where it came from. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and instead of just having Illuminati generally as a very general term, we see it as, as a key progenitor of, of the protocols from the Adam Weishaupt's genius uh, through the Rothschilds controlling currencies, if we can allow ourselves to look at the phase development and the process that it went through, mm -hmm. instead of just this knee-jerk thing, oh, it's forgery, it's forgery. Oh, you're not anti-Semitic, are you? You're not anti-Semitic. Uh, we, we just got these uh, knee-jerk reactions that were given. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, I heard Eric Pickles, uh, Zaid's actually sent me the video, uh, Eric Pickles, the Conservative Party, saying that anyone who uses the word Zionism, we can infer that they're being anti-Semitic. Uh, mm. So... Uh, well, there, there is a quote in the, in the programs about how the use of anti-Semitism is essential yeah. for the control of our lesser brethren. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and uh, that is remarkable, especially if you're trying to believe the official story, that uh, 
that the Russian secret police composed it in order to generate anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the actual author of the protocols is saying that, you, that they, they, they need that to, um, for, for the dynamic that they are setting in motion. Mm -hmm. All right, Nick, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, because we, we are going to do another interview uh, with Nick where we're going to talk about his latest book. Um, what, just give us the title of your latest book, Nick. Well, we come on to that tomorrow. Right? All right. <laughs> yeah, don't, All blow, right. don't blow my logic circuits talking about different things. Right. All right. Uh, yeah. um, so, but we're going to cover some of the. Perhaps uh, quote Gillard Atzman. Uh, that's a good quote. Okay, yeah, we've not read this one. So, um, Gillard Atzman, so just tell us who he was or who, who he is. Well, he's a well known um, alto sax player and a philosopher. He used to be in the IDF Jewish uh, Israeli army uh, and he's now sort of over here and um, generally a good fellow. So he said, uh, American Jewry makes any debate on whether the protocols of the learned elders of Zion are an authentic document or a forgery irrelevant. American Jews do control the world. Right, okay, so that's his quote. Yeah. All right, Nick, well, um, thanks very much for today's interview and um, I look forward uh, to do the next one tomorrow. Now, I just want to make a few comments before we finish. Firstly, I apologize for the sound quality in that section. I accidentally deleted the audio files and I had to rescue the sound from one of the cameras. Uh, now, I think Nick has put forward a strong case that the Protocols of Zion may have been a genuine document, albeit that the document would have had a different name when it was first written. If you read mainstream websites like Wikipedia, you don't get any of the discussion provided by Nick today. All you get is a statement that the document is a forgery, whatever that means. And as Bill Cooper pointed out in his book, a very strong case can be made that the underhand practices outlined in that document are very similar to, or a blueprint for what is going on today. Remember, believe none of what you read, including on Wikipedia, and only half of what you see, I'm Richard D. Hall, good night. <laughs>